I hope that every time you sing that hymn that you realize you're making a promise to God. My life I give henceforth to live, O Christ, for Thee alone. God holds us accountable for the one things that we say and also He holds us accountable, I believe, for the things that we sing oftentimes that we sing mindlessly without realizing we've just made a solemn commitment to God. Keep that in mind next time you sing that song and remember you have sung it already. Please take your Bibles and turn with me, if you will, over to Luke chapter 20. Tonight, the Lord willing, we're going to be looking at Luke chapter 20, verses 27 through 40, not verse 38 as it says in the bulletin, but through verse 40. Marriage and the resurrection. Today is Resurrection Sunday. Marvelous, wonderful, delightful time as we consider the resurrection of Christ, but that is the basis for our resurrection. That's what 1 Corinthians 15 is all about. How Jesus Christ, because he rose from the dead, guarantees that we also will rise from the dead. That's the reason, as we saw this morning, that not only the believers will rise from the dead, but that the unbelievers will rise from the dead to a judgment of damnation. A rather serious issue. But there are some other things about the resurrection that we find in Scripture which often are not preached on Resurrection Sunday. And since this happens to tie in with what we've been studying over in the book of Acts, we're going to be seeing that in just a moment. I thought we would cover it tonight, marriage and the resurrection. The resurrection has some very unique features that... Um, we don't often think about, and perhaps we haven't really stopped to analyze prior to this. I'm in Luke chapter 20, beginning in verse 27. Then came to him certain of the Sadducees, which deny that there is any resurrection. And they asked him, saying, Master, <laughs> oh, how hypocritical. They did not consider him to be their master. Moses wrote unto us, and they didn't believe Moses either, If any man's brother die, having a wife, and he die without children, that his brother should take his wife, and raise up seed unto his brother. There were therefore seven brethren. Nice, good, round, biblical number, the number of completion. And the first took a wife, and died without children. And the second took her to wife, and he died childless. And the third took her, and in like manner the seven also, and they left no children and died. Last of all, the woman died also. I guess so after all those guys. Therefore, in the resurrection, which they didn't believe in, whose wife of them is she? because the rabbis thought she would always go back to the first one. For seven had her to wife. And Jesus answering said unto them, The children of this world marry and are given in marriage. Which, by the way, is a very clear indicator that the man would marry, but the wife would be given by her father. The father has the authority over the young virgin wife, to give her in marriage. And that, that phrase shows up a number of times in Scripture. Wish we had time to talk about it tonight. But the father has the authority over his daughters. But they which be accounted worthy to obtain that world, that is on the other side of this life, and the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage. There we have that same dual set of phrases. Neither can they die any more. For they are equal unto the angels, and are the children of God, being the children of the resurrection. Two also very fascinating phrases. Now that the dead are raised, which is really what they were arguing about, they didn't care very much about the law of leveret marriage, although we'll see some very interesting rabbinic ideas about that in a moment. Their real issue was the resurrection. And so Jesus answers the surface argument 
right off the bat, but gets to the heart of the argument. Now that the dead are raised, even Moses, whom they have just quoted, they've quoted him as an authority, they don't really believe him, but since they've used him as an authority, Jesus comes back to Moses. Even Moses showed at the bush. This is Exodus chapter 3, verse 14. When he calleth the Lord God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Ah. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Abraham, 2000 B.C. Isaac, his son. Jacob, his son. Moses, 1400 B.C., 600 years later. Speaking of him in the present tense. Now that the dead are raised, even Moses showed at the bush when he calleth the Lord the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. For he is not a God of the dead, but of the living, for all live unto him. God speaks of himself in the present tense as being the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob 600 years after they died. Jesus bases that argument on the tense of a verb. I am, that I am. Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. And certain of the scribes answering said, Master, thou hast well said. They thought, wow, that's the best argument we've ever heard against the Sadducees on that subject. And after that, they durst not ask him any questions at all. The Gospel of Matthew covers the three different challenges that are given to the Lord Jesus Christ. But here we focus in on that one, which is the issue of the resurrection and the issue of marriage and the resurrection. As we've been studying the book of Acts and how it deals with work, in that case, the Apostle Paul making tense, we just finished looking at the creation mandate. And as we've noted, Orthodox Jews historically and biblical scholars currently view work as one of the first two basic commandments of God. The first commandment in the creation mandate is to be fruitful and multiply, and that, of course, is an essential element of marriage. Since today is Resurrection Sunday, I thought it would be appropriate to cover the topic of marriage and the resurrection. Certainly marriage in and of itself is usually a topic of interest for most people. And so it is fascinating that Jesus addressed the divine institution of marriage in the context of the resurrection. Now, you know, when I was a young single man in the men's dorm at Dallas Seminary, all of the guys who lived in that dorm desperately wanted to get married before the rapture would happen. When people would ask us about our eschatology, we would tell them that we held to the pre-trib, post-mar system. They would look at us somewhat puzzled. Of course, they'd heard of the pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, pre-mill, post-mill, and ah-mill positions. But what was this new weird theology that the men in Stern's Hall were espousing? And so we would explain. We believed that the rapture would be pre-tribulational, but post-marriage. <laughs> if you know anything about marriage in the Bible, and marriage in pagan society, you soon come to the conclusion that marriage is a messy thing with a lot of twists and turns as mankind has perverted what was designed for our blessing and for God's glory. You soon learn that because Satan and the fallen angels, not merely the elect angels, do not have the joy of marriage, the devil wanted to destroy this incredible gift of God to man. Hence, the very first marriage was wrecked by the fall even before the conception of the first child. For if Cain, the first child, had been conceived before the fall, there would have been a sinless line that could have carried on the original creation mandate. The creation and the fall occur in Genesis chapters 1 through 3. The conception of Cain occurs in Genesis 4, Genesis 4, 1. And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. Since that time, not merely the devil and the demons have attacked marriage, but the depraved flesh, the old sin nature of man, and the things of the world have viciously attacked God's gift of marriage to man. 
The rules for marriage have also changed along the way. God changed some of the rules, and sinful men have changed a lot more of them, as, em uh, as evidenced by the pathetic case of Obergefell versus Hodges this past summer. In the beginning, before sin began to destroy the human genome, and prior to the giving of the law in the days of Moses, brothers actually married their full sisters. That's obviously where Cain got his wife. Genesis chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bare Enoch. And he built a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son, Enoch. The scripture explicitly tells us that Adam and Eve not only had sons, but they also had daughters, Genesis 5, 4. And the days of Adam, after he had begotten Seth, were 800 years, and he begat sons and daughters. A lot of people have challenged creationists on that issue. Where did Cain get his wife? The answer is there in Genesis 5, 4. So that we don't miss the point, the entire genealogy of Genesis 5, from Seth all the way down to Noah, mentions that every pre-flood patriarch not only had sons, but also had daughters. Seth lived after he begat Enos 807 years and begat sons and daughters. Verse 10, and Enos lived after he begat Cainan 815 years and begat sons and daughters. Verse 13, and Cainan lived after he begat Mahalaliel 840 years and begat sons and daughters. Verse 16, and Mahalaliel lived after he begat Jared 830 years and begat sons and daughters. Verse 19, and Jared lived after he begat Enoch 800 years and begat sons and daughters. Verse 22, and Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters. Verse 26, and Methuselah lived after he begat Lamech 780 and two years and begat sons and daughters. Verse 30, and Lamech lived after he begat Noah 595 years and begat sons and daughters. <laughs> you get the idea. God was making a point there. Where did the wives come from? The same is true for the entire list of patriarchs from Noah to Abraham after the flood in Genesis chapter 11, six chapters later. And Shem lived after he begat Arphaxad 500 years and begat sons and daughters. Verse 13, and Arphaxad lived after he begat Salah 403 years and begat sons and daughters. Verse 15, and Salah lived after he begat Eber 403 years and begat sons and daughters. Verse 17, and Eber lived after he begat Peleg 430 years and begat sons and daughters. Verse 19, and Peleg lived after he begat Reu, 209 years, and begat sons and daughters. Verse 21, and Reu lived after he begat Serug, 207 years, and begat sons and daughters. Verse 23, and Serug lived after he begat Nahor, 200 year, years, and begat sons and daughters. And Nahor lived after he begat Terah, 119 years, and begat sons and daughters. That's where they got their wives. Prior to giving the law, men often married their closest female relatives and nobody thought anything about it. That's before the law. Because God had not yet instituted the prohibitions of Sinai. In fact, Abram, who later becomes Abraham, and Sarai, who later becomes Sarah, when Abraham married Sarai, she was his half-sister. Genesis chapter 20. And Abraham journeyed from thence toward the south country and dwelt between Kadesh and Shur and sojourned in Gerar. And Abraham said of Sarah his wife, She is my sister. And Abimelech king of Gerar sent and took Sarah. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said unto him, Behold, thou art but a dead man. For the woman which thou hast taken, for she is a man's wife. God doesn't approve of men taking other men's wives. But Abimelech had not come near her, and he said, Lord, wilt thou also slay a righteous nation? Said he not unto me, she is my sister? And she even herself said, he is my brother. In the integrity of my heart and innocency of my hands have I done this. <laughs> well, integrity of heart, innocency of hands. You know, guy shows up with a, a woman and the guy says, I'm going to take her for my wife. A little bit of funny things going on there. But um, Abimelech said unto Abraham, what sawest thou that thou hast done this thing? And Abraham said, because I thought surely the fear of God is not in this place and they will slay me for my wife's sake. And yet, indeed, she is my sister. She is the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother, and she became my wife. She was his half-sister. To our way of thinking, that, of course, is really kinky. But prior to the giving of the law, it was not sin. Today, we rightly call those kinds of relationships incest because the law that God gave to Moses at Mount Sinai. Although we're not under the law, either for salvation or sanctification, 
The moral standards set out in the law are supported by the New Testament Gospels and the New Testament Epistles, and these moral standards therefore remain. Genesis also presents us with the issue of who were the sons of God that came in unto the daughters of men in Genesis chapter 6. In other words, who were the giants, the Nephilim, that are mentioned there in Genesis chapter 6? Verses 1, 2, and 4. It came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair and that they took them wives of all which they chose. There were giants in the earth in those days and also after that when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men and they bare children unto them, the same became mighty men which were of old men of renown. Giants is the Nephilim. The falling ones are fallen ones. Although it's a fascinating study in itself, it would take an entire message, so I'm not going to preach it tonight. It's beyond the scope of our study. However, if you were taking notes when I preached through the book of Genesis, you know the answer to that question. May I remind you, as we did this morning, what you don't really learn, you don't remember. What you don't use, you lose. The women at the tomb didn't even remember that Jesus had told them that he would be crucified, buried, and rise after three days. It was only after the angels reminded them that they remembered. So I hope you took notes on Genesis 6 because I probably will never have a chance to preach that topic again at this church. So skipping ahead to the law, marriage matters get much more complex. For example, immediately prior to the giving of the law, that's right before the law was given, a man could marry his father's sister, his blood aunt. Doesn't that sound bizarre? As a matter of fact, did you know that you already know one very important man and woman like this? A man who married his father's sister? And that couple actually is listed in the Heroes of Faith in Hebrews chapter 11. I read that chapter this morning. Did any of you pick up on that? A man who married his father's sister, that is, he married his blood aunt? Of course, you know that I'm speaking about Amran and Yochebet, or Jochebet as it's written in the English text. You all know Amram and Jochebed, right? What? Who are they? I mean, you don't know that Amram and Jochebed are listed in Hebrews chapter 11? If you look in there, you'll find them. It's in verse 23. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw that he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. That's right, Jochebed, or Yochevet, a very popular name in Israel today, was the very brave lady who hid Moses in the basket of bulrushes and was the mother of Moses, Miriam, and Aaron, the very first high priest. But she was not only their mother, she was their great aunt. <laughs> Boggles the mind, doesn't it? It says so over in Exodus chapter 6. Let me read you verses 18, 19, and 20. And the sons of Kohath, Amram, that's Moses' father, and Izhar, and Hebron, and Uziel, and the years of the life of Kohath were 133 years. And the sons of Merari, Mahali, and Mushi, these are the families of Levi according to their generations. So we find that's why Moses and Aaron are in the line of Levi. And Amram took him, Jochebed, you'll have it, his father's sister to wife. And she bare him Aaron and Moses, and the years of the life of Amram were 130 and seven years. Over in Numbers 26, 59, in the name of Amram's wife was Jochebed, or Jochebed, the daughter of Levi, whom her mother bare to Levi in Egypt. And she bare unto Amram, Aaron, and Moses, and Miriam, their sister. Weird, huh? You might say that Amram and Yochevet made it right under the wire because their son Moses was the one to whom God gave the law prohibiting a man from marrying his blood aunt. And yet his mother and his father, the father married his blood aunt, which made his mother also his great aunt. And yet God gave to Moses the commandment that that couldn't take place. Leviticus chapter 18, verses 12, 13, and 14. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy father's sister, she is thy father's near kinswoman. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy mother's sister, for she is thy mother's near kinswoman. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy father's brother, thou shalt not approach unto his wife, she is thine aunt. 
Very, very clear in the Mosaic Law that that would be a prohibited relationship. And yet prior to the law, it was not only permitted, but God used that relationship to produce Moses, who led the children of Israel out of slavery. You see, God changed some of the rules along the way as the, the genome, the human genome, began to get corrupted and all kinds of problems happen now when blood relatives marry one another. In fact, Leviticus 18 has a huge list of prohibited marriages. We won't read the entire chapter, but incestuous marriage relationships that are prohibited include, in other words, a person may not marry one's mother, one's father, one's stepmother, one's paternal or maternal sister, one's paternal or maternal brother, one's paternal sister through one's father's wife, one's daughter, one's granddaughter, a woman and her daughter, either at the same time or at separate times, a woman and her granddaughter, either at the same time or separate times, one's aunt by blood, one's father's brother, one's father's brother's wife, one's daughter-in-law, one's brother's wife, except under the law of leveret marriage, which is the subject of our text tonight, one's wife's sister during one's wife's lifetime, even if since divorced. There's quite a list there in Leviticus chapter 18. If you read through it, you'll say to yourself, wow, they really, God really, really, really began to restrict who could marry whom. It was a very, very deep subject the rabbis debated all the time, and we see part of it coming to the surface in our text tonight over in Luke chapter 20. Additionally, the rabbis deduced from this chapter that a person may not marry his grandmother their great-grandmother, their grandfather's wife, the great-grandfather's wife, or their grandfather's wife, or grandson's wife. The Bible also prohibited Jews from marrying a male Moabite or Ammonite convert, Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 4, which is very interesting when you consider that Ruth is a female Moabitess. They were not allowed to marry an Edomite convert up to the third generation from conversion, that's Deuteronomy chapter 23, verses 8 and 9. There were even further restrictions on the priests. Israelite priests, the Kohanim, were not allowed to marry the following individuals, divorcees and prostitutes, converts to Judaism, a woman who had had certain forbidden sexual relationships, that's Deuteronomy, uh, excuse me, Leviticus chapter 21, verse 7, a woman who was born of the prohibited relationships of a Kohen, a priest, that's also verse 7 of Leviticus chapter 21, they could not marry a woman captured during warfare, although a regular Israelite could. A widow whose brother-in-law refused to perform the leveret marriage. Interesting. Priests had some very special restrictions on them. In fact, there were even further restrictions on the high priests. High priests also had further prohibitions and requirements under the Mosaic law, even though some of these were permitted to other Israelites and to lower priests. Did you know that a high priest could not marry a widow. That's Leviticus 21, verse 14. A high priest was required to marry a virgin maiden. Leviticus chapter 21, verse 13. But if he married a woman otherwise permitted to a priest, and then after the marriage was elevated to the high priesthood, he was allowed to remain married to her. Sodomite so-called marriages were also prohibited. That's Leviticus chapter 18, verse 22, including both males and females. That's Leviticus chapter 18, verse 14. The Bible had a lot to say under the law about what marriages were restricted. Let me tell you something that's going on right now. From a biblical perspective, it's astounding that in June... 2012, the American branch of conservative Judaism formally approved, quote, same-sex marriage ceremonies in a vote of, get this, 13 to 0. In 2004, the Society for Humanistic Judaism had already issued a resolution supporting, quote, the legal recognition of marriage and divorce between adults of the same sex, unquote, and affirming, quote, the value of marriage between any two committed adults with the sense of obligations, responsibilities, and consequences thereof." Unquote. In 2010, the Society for Humanistic Judaism pledged to speak out against what they called homophobic bullying. Obviously, the more liberal branches of Judaism have come a very long way from the Torah. Both men and women are forbidden from engaging in bestiality. That's Leviticus chapter 18, verse 23, because that is stated to be an abomination to God and a clear violation of the fact that among all the created creatures, 
Adam did not find a suitable mate for himself, and that's why God created Eve. The classical rabbis understood the creation mandate to multiply and fill the earth to mean that it was the divine duty of every male Jew to marry as soon as possible. A large number of Talmudic rabbis urged that male children should be married as soon as they reached the average age of puberty, which was deemed to occur at 14 years of age. You're back in Jewish history, you'll discover that many Jewish boys are getting married at age 14. That seems strange to us, but did you know that kind of thing still goes on in many of the Eastern and pagan countries today? As a matter of fact, I ran across an interesting fact um, not long ago. I think all of you have heard of Mahatma Gandhi. Anybody who's never heard of Mahatma Gandhi? You all heard of Mahatma Gandhi. Okay. Did you know that when he got married, he was 12 years old and his bride was 12 years old in India? <laughs> he became the prime minister of India. Lots of things happen all over the world, folks, that we are simply unaware of that are going on. But anyway, back to the text. Girls were frequently married as young as 12. The classical rabbis saw 18 as the ideal age to get married. And anyone unmarried after the age of 20, get this, was said to have been cursed by God. Rabbinical courts, in fact, frequently tried to compel an individual to marry if they had passed the age of 20 without marriage, although study of the Torah was a valid reason for temporarily remaining unmarried for a man. You know, there are a lot of other marriage laws, too. We won't have time to go over all of them tonight, but let me just give you a few of them, just give a taste of those. There are a huge number of laws that related to the daughter of an Israelite who was sold by her father as a maidservant, that is, as a concubine, and then she turned out not to please her master, or a daughter who was sold as a concubine given to the master's son, or if an additional wife was taken as well as the girl, what was to be done in those situations? There were laws about the slander of a woman, where if a man said, I went to your daughter and I didn't find her to be a virgin, and then her parents could produce the tokens of her virginity, and if it was found untrue, that prohibited the man from ever divorcing her. There were specific laws that related to the firstborn of a hated wife not being dispossessed by the son of a beloved wife. <laughs> I hope you get, or are beginning to get, the sense that marriage, both pre-law and under the law, was a fairly complex and somewhat messy topic. And that the reason that the unbelieving Sadducees those are the humanistic Jews of Jesus' day. Remember I talked about those uh, Jews that have been affirming these things, the American branch of conservative Judaism, which is really the, the middle of the road Jews. They're the, the secular Jews. They're the conservative Jews. They're the orthodox Jews. And among them, there are many different levels, uh, just like there are many different denominations among Protestants. Uh, the same thing is true of Judaism. But not just the conservative Jews, but those who are the humanistic Jews here in America. The Society for Humanistic Judaism, it's actually an organization. That's what the Sadducees were like. They were the humanistic Jews of Jesus' day. Those who did not believe in the supernatural or in the resurrection. And that's why they tried so hard to corner Jesus on this subject. Where they happened to focus was on the law of leveret marriage. That's the marriage of a brother. This is found in the narrative of Genesis 38.8 for the first time. That, of course, is prior to the giving of the law. The law doesn't take place until we get over to Exodus chapter 20, and then it's restated over in Deuteronomy chapter 5. All the way back in Genesis chapter 38, verse 8, prior to the giving of the Mosaic law, when Onan was expected to marry the widow of Er, his brother, and deliberately spilled his seed on the ground so that he would not impregnate Tamar and raise up an heir for heir. God killed him for doing that. That again is a very messy area of marriage. Due to, uh, Genesis chapter 38 beginning in verse 6. And Judah, remember Judah is the progenitor of Jesus. Jesus is from the tribe of Judah. Judah is one of the sons of Jacob. Judah took a wife for Er, his firstborn, whose name was Tamar. And Er, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord slew him. And Judah said unto Onan, Go in unto thy brother's wife, and marry her, and raise up seed to thy brother. So there we have, before the law, we have what 
under the law is called leveret marriage. And Onan knew that the seed should not be his, and it came to pass, when he went in unto his brother's wife, that he spilled it on the ground, lest he that he should give seed to his brother. And the thing which he did displeased the Lord, wherefore he slew him also. Get the idea that God's not very happy when people do things that aren't pleasing to him in the area of sexual relations. I hope you pick up on that. You know the rest of that very sordid story of how Tamar pretended to be a prostitute. She seduced her father-in-law, Judah, by whom she became pregnant with twins. And then you know the incredible grace of God in placing her in the line of the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. Talk about grace. Grace is plastered all over the Old Testament narrative, but we covered this in detail when we studied through Genesis, and I hope you took some notes. Under the Mosaic Law, leveret marriage was codified in Deuteronomy chapter 25, verses 5 through 10. That's the, the subject that's being discussed by the Sadducees as they challenge Jesus. As they are challenging whether or not the resurrection could possibly take place. Deuteronomy chapter 25, beginning in verse 5. If brethren dwell together, and one of them die, and have no child, the wife of the dead shall not marry without unto a stranger. Her husband's brother shall go in unto her, and take her to him to wife, and perform the duty of an husband's brother unto her. And it shall be that the firstborn which she beareth shall succeed in the name of his brother which is dead, that his name be not put out of Israel. And if the man like not to take his brother's wife, then let his brother's wife go up to the gate unto the elders and say, My husband's brother refuseth to take up unto his brother a name in Israel. He will not perform the duty of my husband's brother. Then the elders of his city shall call him and speak unto him. And if he stand to it and say, I like not to take her. Man, I don't want her. Then shall his brother's wife come unto him in the presence of the elders and loose his shoe from off his foot and spit in his face and shall answer and say, So shall it be done unto the man that will not build up his brother's house. And his name shall be called in Israel, The house of him that hath his shoe loosed. It's part of the law. Of course, the most famous leveret marriage in the Bible is, of course, the beautiful story of Ruth, who was married to Boaz. She married a near kinsman of Naomi. Boaz was clearly not related to the bloodline of Ruth because Ruth was a Moabitess. The nearest bloodline extended all the way back to the incestuous relationship that Lot, Abraham's nephew, had with his two daughters after he fled from Sodom and his wife was turned into a pillar of salt. That was about 900 years prior to the book of Ruth because the book of Ruth is clearly stated in chapter 1 is written in the days of the judges. So Ruth would not have had any claim on Boaz unless it was a claim that Naomi herself could have made. The leveret claim actually belonged to Naomi as a Jewish, Jewess under the law, but she waived her claim in favor of her daughter-in-law because Naomi was too old to bear children. Now this is going to blow your mind, but it's what the text says. According to Ruth 4.3, Boaz and the one who is only called Hosachan one were the brothers of Elimelech, Naomi's deceased husband. That makes perfect sense in the requirements of the law of leveret marriage because a brother was required to step in and fill the gap for the widow who was left without a husband or sons to carry on the family name. And of course, Elimelech and both Kilion and Mahlon were dead. Because Naomi could not bear sons, Ruth became the recipient of the blessing of marriage to Boaz, who was probably between 35 and 40 years older than Ruth. Ruth had been married for about 10 years, according to chapter 1, before coming back to Israel with Naomi, which would have put her age somewhere between 22 and 26 years old. The Moabites married him off at about 12. And even some of the early Jews did so too, as we've seen already. 
Normally, a girl would have been married at least by the age of 16, so if you add 10 to that, you've got some, the girl between somewhere between 22 and 26 years old. It's a fascinating study, but beyond the study this evening, we won't have time for it. But it's interesting to me that all the commentators dance around those two questions. I've read a lot of commentaries on Ruth. And you know what? All they say is that somehow Boaz was a near kinsman to Naomi. <laughs> Even though the text, I think, makes it very clear. Even though the law of leveret marriage makes it very clear how Boaz was related to Naomi. But they, they dance around that because, you see, it comes to some what we would consider rather mm, awful conclusions as to how Ruth is thereby related to Boaz and what the ages of the two of them might have been. But the obvious keys in the text, chapter 4, verse 3, prove that Boaz was Ruth's uncle by marriage. I think things have changed, folks. He could not have been her uncle by blood because that was one of the prohibitions under Mosaic law. But uncle by marriage was not prohibited under the law. And we're in the period of the law. Law has already been given. Although it's less directly stated, the age difference was probable in light of Moabite pagan marriage customs and Jewish marriage customs at that time. Leveret marriage is the question the Sadducees are putting to Jesus about marriage and the resurrection. And it's rather interesting that there was a leveret marriage in Jesus' bloodline because he's a descendant of Boaz and Ruth. Isn't it interesting how scripture ties together and how you see the grace of God moving through the text in spite of all kinds of horrendous sins? Four women are mentioned in the genealogy of Jesus. And every one has a kinky marriage problem. It's also of interest that in this context that leveret marriage is the question in the text tonight because Jesus was, in fact, a blood descendant both of Judah through Tamar and Ruth through Boaz. Jesus cuts to the quick. In the resurrection, there will not be marriage as we know it. So the hypothetical given by the Sadducees is irrelevant nonsense. You know, marriage is one hot topic, but resurrection has always been a hot topic for debate. We've been seeing that in our text over in Acts chapter 24. Then Paul, after the governor had beckoned unto him to speak, answered, For as much as I know that thou hast been of many years a judge unto this nation, I do the more cheerfully answer for myself, because that thou mayest understand that there have been but yet twelve days since I went up to Jerusalem for to worship. And they neither found me in the temple disputing with any man, neither raising up the people, neither in the synagogues nor in the city. Neither can they prove the things whereof they now accuse me. But this I confess unto thee, that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I, the Sadducees were the ones that called this heresy, of course. The Sadducees are the ones that are ch uh, ch charging Jesus. So worship I the God of my fathers, believing all the things which were written in the law and in the prophets, and have hope toward God, which they themselves also allow, that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and unjust. We talked about that this morning. The resurrection unto righteousness and heaven and blessing, and the resurrection of damnation. And herein do I exercise myself and do always have conscience void of offense toward God and men. Now after many years I came to bring alms to my nation and offerings, whereupon certain Jews from Asia found me purified in the temple, neither with multitude nor with tumult, who ought to have been here before thee and object if they had aught against me, or else let these same here say, if they have found any evil doing in me while I stood before the council, except it be for this one voice, here's where the problem lies that I cried standing among them, touching the resurrection of the dead, I am called in question by you this day. Dear people, that's still the question. All these other things are interesting, but you know in heaven, <laughs> there's not going to be a marriage like we know it. Jesus made that very clear over in Luke chapter 20, verses 27 through 40. Not going to be marriage like we know it. 
We're going to be like the angels of God in heaven. We don't give in marriage. We don't take in marriage. You say, okay, that's Gospels. That's Old Testament. What do the doctrinal epistles say about that? Uh, let's get here into the age of grace. All right, Paul talks about it in, age, uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Now concerning the things whereof ye wrote unto me. So they had questions on this too. Interesting. <laughs> and what are two big questions you find in 1 Corinthians? You find questions about marriage, which is chapter 7. Chapter 6 also includes some of those things, which deal with fornication. But chapter 7 is marriage questions, and chapter 15 is resurrection questions. Concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband. And likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. Defraud ye not one another when either husband or wife withholds the marriage relationship because they're trying to get back at or control their spouse. God calls it defrauding. There is one case when you can do it, he says, though, except it be with consent for a time. You say, well, maybe it'll be a long time, two years. How about that? But no, he tells you how long it can be. That you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer. How long can you go without food? That's how long that abstinence from that marriage relationship can last. And come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. Incontinency means lack of self-control. See, if one of them is trying to manipulate the other one, the other one's going to say, man, this is really hard. And he's going to be looking or she's going to be looking around for somebody else. But I speak this by permission and not of commandment. In other words, you're not required to, to abstain for times of fasting and prayer, but you are permitted to do it. Verse 6, For I would that all men were even as I myself, but every man hath his proper gift of God, one after this manner and another after that. He's not talking about a gift of celibacy. He's talking about the gift of self-control, continency. That's your context. I say, therefore, to the unmarried and widows, and we have many here tonight, it is good for them if they abide even as I. But if they cannot contain, that is, if they do not have continency, if they do not have self-control, let them marry. For it is better to marry than to burn. And he's not talking about burning in hell. He's talking about burning with lust. And unto the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord. This is not just Paul's opinion. He says, this is what Jesus taught. Let not the wife depart from her husband. That's a command. But you know, sometimes people break God's commands. And so he deals with that in verse 11. But, and if she depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. Those are the only two options. And let not the husband put away his wife. This goes both ways, cuts both directions. But to the rest speak I, not the Lord, that is, those of you who have not yet been married, or those of you who are married to an unbeliever. He's going to deal with those two issues here in the next few verses. The rest speak I, not the Lord. If any brother hath a wife that believeth not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. So you became a Christian, but your wife didn't. Is that a good reason for divorce? The Bible says no. And the woman which hath an husband that believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. Now you've heard me preach some messages on that. You've heard me preach how the word holy here is hagioi. It's the word that elsewhere all through the New Testament is translated saints. Set apart ones. You've heard me preach on the issue of household salvation and how God runs lines through Scripture 
of the salvation of households. You, we talked about that, what is going on in the Old Testament, how it's different from what happens in the New Testament. Oh, I hope you took notes. I spent some time on that. Do you remember any of it? How do you deal with practical issues if you don't take notes, if you don't study it, if you don't answer questions that real people are asking in the real world around you today? Questions that are plaguing churches and killing churches and polluting churches and covering them over with all kinds of immorality. Take notes. Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy, even if only one parent is a believer. But if the unbelieving depart, you can't do it as a believer, but if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases. And that word is not deo, which is the marriage bond. It's dulao, which is the service bond. You're no longer under obligation to serve them as you did before if they happen to be the ones who leave. That doesn't break the marriage bond. It breaks the service bond. I can tell you, and I think I've told you this story before, back when I was a young pastor back in North Jersey in Mountain View Gospel Church. <clears throat> that was a long time ago. <laughs> I hate to even think about how long ago that was, almost 40 years. A, a young woman came to me all in tears, and she said, my husband is living with another woman right now, and she doesn't want to do his laundry, so he brings his laundry to me, and he wants me still to do his dirty laundry. Do I have to do it? Can you believe it? Talk about gall. I said, no, that's what this passage is talking about. You're no longer under bondage. That is the servanthood bondage. It's not talking about the breaking of the marriage bond itself. It's talking about the service that you rendered lovingly to the one who is your husband or wife. Obviously, you don't have to keep doing his dirty laundry, washing his stinky socks, washing his dirty underwear. He departed, but he wanted his real wife to keep doing the stuff for him because his harlot mistress didn't want to do it. If the unbelieving depart, let him depart. The brother or sister is not under bondage. Do lao, not deo, in such cases, but God hath called us to peace. For what knowest thou, O wife, whether thou shalt save thy husband? Don't just run off because he's not saved. Or how knowest thou, O man, whether thou shalt save thy wife? Don't leave her just because she's not a Christian. But as God hath distributed to every man, as the Lord hath called every one, so let him walk, and so ordain I in all the churches. When you got saved, what position were you in? If any man called being circumcised, let him not become uncircumcised. Is any man called in uncircumcision, let him not be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing. Uncircumcision is nothing but the keeping of the commandments of God. So he starts off with marriage, but he says, let me give you an illustration that you'll understand. Because that other one is so emotionally charged, it is so difficult for you to deal with. Let me give you one, you Gentiles there at Corinth, that you will understand, which is the issue of circumcision. Now, that's a very highly charged issue for the Jews when you're over in Acts chapter 15 at the Council of Jerusalem. But that's not a big deal for the Gentiles. So he says, but you'll understand it. He's using that as an illustration to show them what state were you in when you got saved? Circumcision is nothing. Uncircumcision is nothing but the keeping of the commandments of God. Let, and here's the principle, let every man abide in the same calling wherein he was called. That gives you another illustration. Art thou called being a servant? Care not for it, but if thou mayest be made free, use it rather. For he that is called in the Lord being a servant is the Lord's free man. Likewise also he that is called being free is Christ's servant. He's giving them illustrations so they'll understand the marriage principles that he's teaching them. You're bought with a price. Be not ye the for, therefore the servants of men. Brethren, let every man wherein he is called therein abide with God. And then he changes the subject. He's been talking about beat up marriages. Now he's going to talk about virgins. Now concerning virgins, I have no commandment of the Lord, yet I give my judgment as one that hath obtained mercy of the Lord to be faithful. Now Paul is not denying inspiration here. He's simply saying this is a subject that Jesus didn't teach on. But Paul is speaking under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit as he writes scripture. 
I suppose, therefore, that this is good for the present distress. I say that it is good for a man so to be. Now, they're going through a time of persecution. That's quite obvious from what Paul writes here in the text. And as you look at church history, and as you look at the Apostle Paul as he's going on his missionary journeys, which we've been looking at in the book of Acts, Paul got beat up every place he went. So he says, I suppose, therefore, it's good for the present distress. I say that it's good for a man so to be. Art thou bound unto a wife? Seek not to be loosed. Art thou loosed from a wife? Seek not a wife. Now he's talking about virgins here, remember that. But, and if thou marry, thou hast not sinned. That's in the masculine. And if a virgin marry, here is the feminine, she hath not sinned. But you know what? You're going to have some problems. <laughs> Anybody who's ever been married knows that. Nevertheless, such shall have trouble in the flesh, but I spare you. But this I say, brethren, and here's the point that he's getting to, and here's the point that helps us understand why Jesus said what he did about marriage and the resurrection. The time is short. It remaineth that both they that have wives be as though they had none. And they that weep as though they wept not. You know, there are a lot of singles who go to bed every night crying because they so badly want a husband or they so badly want a wife. And they that rejoice as though they rejoice not. Very pleased that they're married. And they that buy as though they possess not. All the stuff that you gather. And boy, I tell you, when you get married, you sure gather a lot of stuff, especially if you've got kids. <laughs> I cannot believe how much junk I'm still storing for my 13 kids. <laughs> They've all run off and gotten married. And I've got all their junk in the manse and down in Alabama in the house. It's stuffed full of stuff down there. I've even got some stuff that's in storage in my son's barn down in Alabama. I've got probably 4,000 pounds of books stored in his barn down there. You collect junk in this world. And they that use this world is not abusing it. For the fashion of this world passeth away. Death is coming. There will be a resurrection. What's it going to be like in eternity? And so Paul says, here's where I want you to focus. But I would have you without carefulness, without worry. He that is unmarried careth for the things that belong to the Lord, how he may please the Lord. There's where your focus should be. But he that is married careth for the things that are of the world, how he may please his wife. And men, you're supposed to do that if you're married. But it gives you a different focus on how you live your life. There's a difference also between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman careth for the things of the Lord, that she may be holy both in body and in spirit. But she that is married careth for the things of the world, how she may please her husband. I hope you're beginning to pick up some of the vibes as to why Jesus talks about no marriage in the resurrection. Because in the resurrection, we are not going to be focused on people. We're going to be focused on Jesus. And this I speak for your own profit. Not that I may cast a snare upon you. Oh, no. Listen to what Paul's saying. Oh, it's terrible. Not so that I can cast a snare upon you. But for that which is comely, comely means beautiful. And that you may attend upon the Lord without distraction. Now he's going to talk about fathers and their daughters. But if any man think that he behaveth himself uncomely toward his virgin, if she pass the flower of her age, she's getting older, and if need so require, she can't stand the, the thought of being single for the rest of her life. Let him do what he will, he sinneth not, let them marry. You know, there are dads who have said, my daughter's not going to get married. There are dads who say, man, I wish my daughter would get married and get her out of the house. <laughs> but here's a guy who says, no, I'm not going to let her marry. 
Verse 37 tells us that. Nevertheless, he that standeth steadfast in his heart, having no necessity, but hath power over his own will, and hath so decreed in his heart that he will keep his virgin, doeth well. So then, he that giveth her in marriage doeth well. Man, listen to the second half of this verse. But he that giveth her not in marriage doeth better. Does that blow our way of thinking in the American culture? Are we thinking biblically? The dad has decided there's a good reason I'm not going to give my daughter in marriage. And you know what the daughter says? Yes, dad, I'll do it the way that God has led you because you're the authority that God put into my life. That's hard for most American girls to swallow. Did you know that? I think you probably perceive that. He that giveth her not in marriage. Remember we talked about marrying and giving in marriage. Those are the two things. The man marries, the woman is given in marriage. We find that all over the scriptures. He that giveth her not in marriage doeth better. The wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth. But if her husband be dead, she is at liberty to be married to whom she will only in the Lord. In other words, a widow doesn't have to get her father's permission. She's been through the marriage ringer, and now she knows what to expect and what not to expect, and she knows what kind of guy she does not want to marry. The law that it's dealing with here is not the Mosaic law. That's clearly not the context because we're talking to Corinthians, we're talking to Greeks here. He's talking about the law of the husband. He's not talking about the Mosaic law. He's talking about the union when a man comes together with a woman and they become one flesh. He's talking about as long as her husband liveth. But if her husband is dead, she is at liberty to be married to whom she will. But there is one restriction, only in the Lord. Her father might have married her off to some pagan. She became a Christian. Her husband dies. Now she can't go out and find that other nice-looking young pagan that she had wanted to marry before. She can only be married to someone who's a Christian. But then Paul tells us in verse 40, you know, if she's been widowed, she's happier if she so abide after my judgment. And I think also that I have the Spirit of God. Marriage and the resurrection. Dear people, some of you are single. Some of you are widowed. Some of you are divorced. But remember what Paul's point is here in this passage. The time is short. Jesus is coming. The resurrection and the resurrection state are coming. And in the resurrection state, it will be better than anything you can imagine on earth, including marriage. So don't make marriage your focus. God may or may not give you the privilege of marriage to refine you, and believe me, it refines you. He may or may not give the, that privilege to you. As Paul says here in 1 Corinthians 7, make your focus serving Jesus, whether there's marriage in your future or not. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word and for its power. It is so painfully practical. We need to learn to focus on serving Jesus. The single man cares for the things of the Lord. The single woman cares for the things of the Lord. You may bring marriage about because you have also commanded that it's not good for a man to be alone. And you've commanded the bringing forth of children the propagation of children so that you might spread the good news of Christ from generation to generation. But you've also called some to be single because they have a very specialized opportunity of focusing on Jesus. Thank you, Father, once again for the privilege of studying your word. We pray that you will bless it to our hearts. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.
We've been talking 